Zombie Stories features a wide variety of skins not just made by the official developers, but the community as well. And it's not just restricted to a bunch of specific people, but just about anyone can make their own skins and have it accepted in the game. However, not all skins can be accepted. All skins need to meet specific requirements, so your creations need to meet standards to be accepted. This is what this guide will go over. Welcome to the official Zombie Story Skin Creation Guide. To begin, this guide is split into two parts, Studio and Blender. The video part covers the studio portion, but the Blender portion won't be covered in this video, but it's instead compiled into a public doc in the link. This is for convenience for those who either just want to make a skin or to get better. As of right now, zombie stories are currently not accepting any skins, but gun skins and outfits are accepted. This guide only goes over the studio aspect, so gun skins are the main focus of this video. Additionally, all programs included in this video are only available on the PC platform. Both Studio and Blender are unavailable on mobile or tablet. These programs aren't needed, but I recommend downloading Inkscape for creating your own textures and Paint.net for making your own thumbnails. Finally, even though this only goes over Studio, I recommend checking out the Blender guide regardless, as Studio is generally unrecommended for 3D modeling compared to Blender. But if you just want to learn Studio, don't worry about Blender for now. With all that out of the way, let's begin. First off, you obviously need Studio installed. Simply just go to the Studio landing page and click Start Creating. From there on, it's a very simple installation so don't worry too much. Before we can start making skins, we need to go over how Studio works. When you start up Studio, you will be taken to a page where you can choose a wide variety of places to open. Since this guide goes over primarily modeling, you only need the base plate. First, we'll go over the tabs at the top of your screen. The Home tab, mainly used for opening up the toolbox for frame models. Opening up the UI tab and the terrain editor. We won't need either. The Model tab, which is what we'll be mainly using. This tab includes the solid modeling tools which we will use frequently. The Avatar tab, which we won't use that much. The Test tab, which we'll only use for the device emulator. The View tab, where we can open up important windows including the Explorer and Properties, and Plugins, which will make our lives easier. Once Studio is open, you have to change Studio's appearance to show the following, Explorer and Properties. If you want to rearrange the windows, simply just drag and drop into where you want them to be. Additionally, you'll need to enable CSG V3, which is a beta feature. This is very important as if you don't enable this feature, you'll instead use CSG V2, which is very problematic compared to CSG V3. You can also change the studio's interface from light to dark mode in settings, along with other various settings such as the color specific things, sensitivity, and rendering level. I recommend maxing out quality, but if your device can't handle it, you can lower it. Finally, this guide recommends the following plugins to be installed, Moon Animator V2 and Resize Align. Moon Animator isn't really needed, but it's good for inserting a blank rig for reference. However, I recommend Resize Align. You can also install F3X if you prefer to not use the default Roblox tools for moving parts, but I'll just be using the default ones. I also recommend keeping a separate folder on your PC and saving your base play there as a .rbxl file. This is just for convenience sake. I would also save your skins as a .rbxm file, in a separate folder as well. I'll explain this later. Now we're ready to start making skins. To begin, drag the model pack into the workspace from the toolbox. 
You can make a skin for any of the weapons provided, but for this, we'll use a submachine gun. To begin, you want to have a good idea of what you want your skin to be. You don't want your skin to be too similar to someone else's, but you don't want to blindly go about this, so here's a few tips. Sketch out your gun. Get references. Additionally, you can also upload your image references to Studio, though you have to be careful as whatever you upload goes through moderation. This is useful for recreating parts of a gun. Before we start, we need to go over the basic controls of Studio. To move, you use your WSD keys and Q and E to move up and down. To move your camera, hold down your right mouse button and drag. Here is a list of the important shortcuts you need to remember. With your idea laid out and your basic controls understood, you're now ready to start. We'll begin by breaking down the process. Making your own skin stand out requires you to modify the various parts of them. But before you do so, make sure you go to your explorer and take your selected gun out of the folder, into the workspace, and ungroup the gun. This way, you can get rid of the rest of the pack and leave only the gun you chose. There are a variety of ways to modify guns. Coloring parts, adding additional parts, modifying parts. Before starting, you have a choice to either scale the gun to be larger to make the modeling process easier, or leave it to scale with an avatar. To color a part, it's pretty simple. Just follow what I do in the video and you'll be fine. Changing the material of a part is slightly different though. Simply open up the material manager, select the part you want to change, and then click the material you want to apply. Finally, depending on the material of the part, you're able to give the part special properties such as reflectance and transparency. Just change the values and you're good. If you decide to finish here, group your gun together, give it a name, and save it to your folder. Congrats! You have made your first skin. However, if you want your skin to be accepted into the game, you need to do more with it. This is where you start modifying and adding parts. To add a part, simply go to Model or Home and click Part. If you click the drop down menu, you can also add a variety of other shapes. All of these shapes can be modified with the tools you have. You can precisely move, scale, or rotate them. However, to go further, we need to mention the types of parts used for gun models, between regular parts, unions, and meshes. Regular parts can be modified in any way, shape, or form. Unions are basically the same, but they're made up of multiple parts. And meshes can only be recolored, but they can't be modified unless imported to Blender. With that cleared up, we can now start modifying parts of our gun. To do this, we'll be using the solid modeling tools we have, Union, Negate, and Separate. Ignore Intersect, as we won't be using it very much. To combine parts together, select all the parts combined and union them together. You can revert this by separating them. Additionally, you can turn a regular part into a negative part by selecting a regular part, clicking on negative after. This is important for making holes or cuts into unions, as we will be doing this frequently. You can also turn unions into negative parts, which is useful for when you want to cut something like a star or a hexagon into a part. You can union regular and negative parts to do this. This should help you understand better how gun models are made in studio. Also, be sure to use the pivot point tool as it is very useful for rotating objects around a point. By using unions and negative parts, you are able to make much more complex and detailed parts than normally, which should help your skin stand out. This is also going to make replicating gun parts easier. Once you finish up making your gun part, make sure to name it in the explorer to make it easy to identify. Since the goal was just to modify the submachine gun's handguard, we're done with the gun, so we'll save it as a file and be done with it. However, we still have more to go over. Some skins in the game have custom textures ranging from decals to different materials such as camel. To use these textures, you'll need to find the texture you want to use in the toolbox. And if it's not already there, you'll have to upload it to the website using the creator dashboard. Make sure you have your texture's ID copied. To apply a texture onto a gun part, simply hover over the part in the explorer and find the texture instance. 
Then go over the texture's properties and paste the ID in here. However, the texture will only appear for one side. To apply the texture onto a whole part, you have to copy and paste the texture 5 times with the setting in each instance correctly facing the right way. You can also modify how large the texture is by editing its studs per tile, and you can edit its position by changing its offset stud setting, and you can change its transparency too. For seamless textures such as camels, it's pretty easy using this method, but for singular decals, it'll take a bit of time. Using decal instance won't work since it'll just stretch, and there's unfortunately no option for textures to stop repeating, so you have to do some editing for this. One suggestion would be to edit that decal in a program like paint.net to do something like this. This way, you can use the texture to apply that image while positioning and rescaling it onto the gun to fit properly, without the image repeating. Community-made mythical skins usually feature visual effects apart from modified gun parts, such as particles and beams. This part of the video goes over how to make those, starting with particles. To start simple, we'll show you how to add a light, which is useful for flashlights. When you do so, there are three types of lights you can choose from. Spotlight, surface light, and point light. For flashlights, spotlights are your best option, and for a glow effect, use a point light. Just insert the light into the part where the light should come from, and you're set. Surface lights are typically used for lighting up rooms, so we won't need it here. Editing your light depends on the type you use, but they're practically the same. The only difference is that there's no angle property for point light, since it emits light in all directions anyway. I would also leave shadows off for performance. If you want to test your light, go to lighting and change the clock time to zero. I would also change brightness to zero and change both ambient and outdoor ambient to zero zero zero. You can also change technology to future, but only if your device can handle it. Quickly make a small room and put your light in it. Your default light should be good enough, but the most you should do is increase the brightness by a very small amount or decrease the angle. Now we move on to particles. Particles are simple. To add a particle to a part, just hover over the part in Explorer and insert a particle instance from there. In a properties window, you can edit the various properties a particle has. Here are the important properties you need to know. Light emission determines how much light a particle emits. Light influence determines how much a particle is affected by the lighting of a place. Orientation determines which direction the particle faces. Size changes how big a particle is. Squash stretches or compresses a particle. Texture changes the image of a particle. Transparency changes the visibility of a particle. Emission direction determines the direction of a particle. Lifetime changes how long a particle lasts for. Rate changes how many particles appear at once. Rotation determines the rotation of a particle. Rot speed changes how fast a particle rotates. Speed determines how fast the particle travels. Red angle changes the direction of the particle from its emission direction. Acceleration determines the acceleration of a particle in a specific axis. Drag changes how a particle slows down to stop. And lock to part determines if a particle is locked to the motion of the part it's coming from. It's a lot of settings, but these are important for editing particles. As long as you can understand what each setting does from the name, you'll be fine. Additionally, some of these settings such as transparency and size have a special setting where you can adjust their values over time. So you can make fading particles that can grow bigger or smaller through their lifetime, or particles that change color over time. Other options such as lifetime road speed are also special, where the particle can be randomized based on the values. Next, beams and trails. To make a beam, one of the parts in your gun will need two instances called attachments, and you will also need a beam instance. The attachments determine the start and end points of your beam, and the other instance controls the beam. Go to the properties of your beam and set your attachment points. The direction of the beam changes depending on how you set up your beam, so be careful, though it's not too big of a deal. 
The properties of a beam are similar to particles, though there are some differences. Curve size determines the curve at the corresponding attachment. Segments change the amount of segments in a curve, with a higher amount of segments resulting in a more curved beam. Width changes the width of the beam at one end. Trails are practically the same, but they're set up differently. They need two attachments, but it's not for length, rather width. Lifetime determines how long segments of a trail last for. Min max length determines the maximum or minimum length of a trail. And width scale influences how wide a trail is, with 1 equals 100% and 0 equals 0%. Finally, we need to go over surface GOIs, which is used for displaying text without the need of decals and textures. This is great for any skin, including visual ammo counters or glowing text. First, you'll need a part to display your text. Depending on what your text is going to be, what you do here is going to be different. But in this case, we're going to make a floating ammo counter. So we'll make an invisible part and apply the surface GUI onto it. Then you'll have to insert a text label instance in the surface GUI. If the text appears to be out of scale, don't worry for now. If the text is on the wrong side, you'll have to edit it in the surface GUI's properties to correct it. Once it's corrected, you have to correct the text size. There are a few ways to do this. You can either go into the text label's properties and manually edit it by increasing or decreasing the value, or you can go into the surface GUI's properties and change sizing mode to fixed size, and change canvas size to the same values. Depending on how clear you want your text to be, you can set it to a value like a thousand, but it's up to you. Afterwards, go into the text label's properties and change the size of the same value as the ones you set in canvas size. With your surface GUI set up, you can now edit the text itself. For the most part, the properties of them are easy to get, but there are a few important ones to go over. Font face changes the font of your text and also has additional settings that change up the text even more. Rich text allows you to use markup to specify what parts of the text you want to be bolded or underlined or etc. And text scale scales up the image as large as possible if text size is still too small. Additionally, to make the text glow, you have to go into the surface joy's properties and edit the light influence, similar to beams and particles. That's about it for text, but surface joys aren't just limited to text. They can also utilize images as well by inserting the image label instance. Finally, if you want more fonts, you can search for fonts in the toolbox where you can find and download whatever font you want. That just about wraps it up for a big majority of the modeling part, but we're not done yet. To become even better at this, you also have to pay attention to technical parts as well. What I mean by this is the optimization of your skins is important, as well as unexpected problems you will run into. First, we need to discuss optimization. Of course you want your skin to be detailed, but you don't want it to be overly laggy. This is where I have to explain Triss, which means how many triangles are present in a part. A regular brick has a Triss count of 12 for reference. I need to explain this because it leads to a problem Studio has where, during the creation of a union, parts may sometimes be displaced by the smallest of decimals. This causes a union to gain a needed Triss, which costs performance. You can check this by going to wireframe mode. The next problem is the toolbox. At the start of the video, I said to save your creations in a folder on your desktop. This is because the toolbox is very unreliable when it comes to uploading your creations. In my experience, it's not only quite buggy, but because of Roblox moderation, your creations may be moderated for no good reason. Because of this, it's best for you to save your creations as a file to prevent this. Additionally, the toolbox is also lackluster when it comes to finding images or frame models. Not only is the toolbox infamous for uploading malicious content, but the toolbox is kind of broken when it comes to doing something as simple as even searching up content. Even then, the toolbox lacks search filters, which makes it even worse. Another problem is CSG itself. I mentioned earlier in the video to ditch CSG v2 and switch to CSG v3. This is because CSG v2 is extremely unsafe to use due to one big problem. CSG v2 has a problem where unions can sometimes become corrupt. This is where unions become permanently visible and also inseparable. When a union becomes corrupt, there's only two ways to retrieve it. Either you get lucky and it magically comes back, 
or you have to go through a very tedious process to retrieve it. CSG V3 fixes these problems, which is why I highly recommend switching to CSG V3. Finally, particle lag. This is also attributed to optimization, but this is different from Triss. Having too many particles in a skin may cause various devices to lag, so be careful when using particles or beams. The last bit of this guide goes over taking photos of your creation, so you can skip this part if you want. However, stick around if you want to share your creations in the Discord or any other place. Go to your camera and decrease your FOV to around 40 to 30. Then you'll want to enable the device emulator, which makes it easier to take photos depending on the portrait size you want. For phone portraits, change it to one of the phone options, but for desktop portraits, change it to one of the desktop portraits. Once you have your photo set up, change this setting to actual resolution, screenshot it, and you're good. The screenshot will be saved in a folder you have to find, which will likely be in pictures. We're nearing the end of the studio part of the guide, so I'll finish it off with some tips for making skins. These tips aren't really directed towards technical stuff, but more so general stuff. Keep your creations clean. Sometimes less is more, so adding too much detail can end up in your creations being cluttered. The color palette of your skins are important. Try to use colors that go well together. Sometimes you're able to get away with this, but you, you'll have to find a way to make it work. Always name your parts. This makes the developer's lives and your life easier. Plus, this is just a good habit to pick up on. Always save your work. Who knows what might happen, so it's better to be safe than sorry. Finally, don't just stick to making skins. If you really want to improve, branch out and make other stuff. This is how you really get better at modeling. That wraps it up for the studio part of this guide. Hopefully it was helpful in some way. Though if you really want to make your creations even better, I recommend checking out the blender guide. But for now, thanks for watching and have fun creating your skins.